Let's pray. Lord, we know one day we'll be doing that in heaven. And we look forward to that day. And so we're asking in this service, you'll bring some heaven to earth. And help us get a heavenly perspective as we look at our lives, as we look at our nation, as we look at our world, as we look at the future. And so we ask your blessing now in this time of Bible study because you have indeed promised a blessing to the person who reads, hears, and keeps the words of the book that we're about to open, the book of Revelation. So Lord, we are people in need of a blessing right now. Bless your people, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You can all be seated. Good morning. Good to see you all in the sanctuary right now. So, uh, just a little update. What do you think of our really super cool screens that we have? We saved a lot of money. Uh, we're going to put an old black and white TV in there. No, uh, we have new screens that will be installed soon. And, uh, and then we have our lights that we're going to bring back in again. Our balcony will be open really soon. All of this by Easter. Uh, there's a slight delay in the pews. So we're gonna have, we're gonna get you out of those really funky chairs. Those are bad chairs, aren't they? They're the worst. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we're gonna put in some nice upholstered chairs in the interim, and, uh, and then we'll have our pews pretty soon, and we'll get everything fired up and opened up across our campus, so that's what we're looking forward to. So I'd like to hear from the folks out in the amphitheater on the count of three, I need you to yell as loud as you can, Jesus. I'm talking to you amphitheater people, ready? You say Jesus on three. One, two, three, go. Wait, you guys can't do it. Because then I can't hear them. Okay, amphitheater, are you hearing me? Okay, here we go. Jesus on three. One, two, three. Forget it. Okay, I didn't hear them. Did you hear them? Okay, I must be going deaf. I don't know what's going on. Hey, uh, of course, Easter is coming. We have some flyers for you as you leave. Today, they come in packets of five. Use them if, take one if you'll use all of them. If not, uh, open it up and share with somebody else. But it's just a straightforward Easter invitation. It says, he has risen on the cover. Death died when Christ rose. Uh, I am the resurrection and the life uh, from Jesus. And then just kind of the service times. And basically, uh, Palm Sunday we're going to obviously have our services. And next Sunday, which is Palm Sunday, we're going to be joined by our special friend, Phil Wickham. It's going to be awesome. And we're going to hear a message from Pastor Jonathan Laurie. That's next Sunday, Palm Sunday. And of course, tomorrow is Jonathan's birthday. Was that a way to get presents telling us all that? Okay. Good Friday, of course, we'll have services. They're going to be at 12 in the afternoon, 7 p.m. at both Harvest and R Riverside and Harvest Orange County. And Easter Sunday, uh, we're going to have an early service at 8 o'clock in the morning. And then, let's see, 8, no, 6 a.m., excuse me, 8 a.m., 10 a.m., and 12 p.m. So we're adding a service for Easter. Grab these as you leave. And, you know, these are to give out, to invite people to come and join you to church. I want to welcome Harvest Orange County right now and also Harvest Kumalani on the island of Maui. Let's welcome them with some applause. It's our extended church. Glad you're all with us. Let's turn in our Bibles now to Revelation chapter 11. We're going to look at Revelation 11 and 12. And the title of my message is How to Overcome the Devil. Well, spring is officially here. And I like that. I like to get all that daylight back. I wish we could just do away with daylight savings time here in California. But still, when we get to spring forward, though I lose an hour of sleep, I love having daylight going on longer. And that means summer is coming. So some of us might be thinking a little bit about our summer vacation. Hopefully it'll be better than last summer. And we'll have more freedom to get out and about and and we're maybe thinking about where we might go. Maybe someplace warm. Wouldn't it be nice if the devil took a vacation? Wouldn't it be nice if Satan took summer off and went someplace really warm like hell? Um, <laughs> reminds me of a story I've shared with you before of a, 
of a man who, in Chicago, a businessman, who was going to go on vacation with his wife to Florida. But he was going to leave a day before. So uh, he, he flew and landed in Florida. And, uh, and he texted his wife. But here's the problem. His wife just changed her phone number. So when he texted her, the text did not go to his wife. But instead, it went to an elderly pastor's widow. The pastor had just died. And her family was gathered in the home, and her phone lit up, and she got a text from her husband, uh, which wasn't her husband at all. It was this other guy, but it was from her husband. She read it, shrieked, and fainted. And the family came rushing in to see what happened. They picked up her phone, and this was the message she got. Dearest wife, just landed yesterday. Looking forward to your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> P.S. It sure is hot down here. Yeah. How many of you have heard that before? Okay. What do you want, a medal? Okay. I changed it a little. I don't know if you noticed that I changed it. It used to be an email. Now it's a text. This never happened. It's just a story. But anyway, coming back to my point, it would be great if the devil took summer off, a month off, a week off, a day off. A week, uh, an hour off even. No, but he doesn't do that. The Bible describes him as restless, roaming about, looking for trouble. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been overcome by the devil? I think if we're all honest, we would answer yes. Does it always have to be that way? Do you have to constantly be his punching bag? Do you have to be defeated again and again and again and trapped in some vice or addiction or some other area of your life where he has control, the answer is no. And I want to talk to you in this message about how to overcome the devil. Listen, we need to know we are in a spiritual battle. It's real. If we could pull the veil back and see into the supernatural world, it would blow our little minds the realm of God and of Satan, of angels and of demons, the, the, the world that is to come, the world we'll all enter into one day. And it's a spiritual battle that rages. In Ephesians 6, Paul says, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual authorities in high places. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God. Well, now we come here in Revelation 11 to the midway point of the book of Revelation. We're halfway through. And there's a shift in the narrative as well. Let's compare Revelation again to a movie. Up to this point, John has been an observer. Remember, he was on the island of Patmos, banished there. And the Lord came and gave this amazing revealing of the future. And so up to this point, as we read the Gospel of John, John is observing, he's recording, He's describing to the best of his ability in first century language what he was seeing. But all of a sudden, he's brought into the story. Maybe you've watched a movie and you relate to a certain character. And you're thinking, oh, I wish I could go into that movie. I wish I could live in that movie. Or if I were that character, what would I do under those circumstances? In effect, John is brought into the movie, if you will, and he plays an actual role in it. Uh, in Revelation chapter 10, a powerful angel gives to John a small scroll and he tells him to eat it. So this scroll or little book, if you will, is a revelation of what is coming and it's hard. So as he eats it, it's sweet at first, and then, then it turns bitter in his stomach. Sort of like my experience with Krispy Kreme donuts. They're great going down, but after 20 minutes, you, you're thinking, why did I do that? I think my record is six. Six late, don't judge me. <laughs> you know they're smaller than normal, don't you? Have you ever a little smaller? And when it's a hot donut, come on. But anyway, so this is a revelation of what's coming. He eats it. But then it turns bitter in his mouth. And we shift gears now in Revelation 11, starting in verse 1. John writes, there was given a rod, a, like a measuring rod, or a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple. So all of a sudden, John's in the story. Now he's part of it. and He's measuring the temple. Uh, don't measure it, uh, leave out the outside of the temple 
uh, that's given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I will give my power to two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days, and they'll be clothed in sackcloth. By the way, that's three and a half years. There are two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. They have power to shut heaven so no rain falls. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. You know, it's interesting, chapter 11 of Revelation opens up with the city of Jerusalem. And what it is saying is Jerusalem will play a key role in the end times. That's so important. Think about this. This was written 2,000 years ago. And a finger is being pointed. Look to Israel and look to Jerusalem. They will play a role. Ironically, the name Jerusalem means city of peace. But more wars have been fought at her doorstep than any other city in the entire world. The other day I had the opportunity to be in a phone call with a handful of pastors with a consul general of Israel who's based in Los Angeles. So he was sort of giving us an update on what's going on over there. And uh, we all know that Iran is the avowed enemy of Israel. Uh, they're the number one sponsor of terrorism around the world. In fact, today I read in a news site that they're directly threatening us right now, the United States, and they're always threatening Israel and have made no secret of their desire to eradicate the Jewish nation, take over the city of Jerusalem, and drive the Jewish people into the sea. Now up to this point, Iran is engaged in her acts of terrorism by proxy through other terrorist organizations like Hezbollah and Hamas. But uh, the consul general told us for the first time, Israeli troops are directly fighting Iranian troops. Uh, and it's happening over in Syria. You say, well, what does that have to do with anything? It has a lot to do with what the Bible says about the last days. We'll get to this in the future, but in Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39, we read of a, we read of a large force attacking Israel in the last days, known as Magog. Many believe that could be modern day Russia. And one of the allies of Magog is identified as Persia, which is modern day Iran. So we know one of the signs of the end times will be hostility from Iran toward Israel. And so we look at this situation here that, that's happening and it, and it just continues to escalate. I saw just the other day that Iran is boasting of some missile city that they have. Basically, it's all these missiles that they have collected in a high-tech underground base that they intend, there's some video right there if you look at the screen, and they intend to use these missiles against Israel. So they're making no secret about what their real desires. But it's fascinating how the name of Jerusalem keeps coming up again and again in Scripture as a super sign of the end times. Zechariah 12.3 says, On that day when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, God says, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. But there are some things that have to happen there in Jerusalem for these events to unfold. Number one, Jerusalem must be in Jewish hands, and it is. Of course, uh, May 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation. But they did not have control of Jerusalem. That actually happened in the Six-Day War in 1967. So for the first time, Jerusalem was under the control of the Jewish nation again. So that's been fulfilled. But then number two, as we're reading here, the third temple must be rebuilt. There's been two Jewish temples. Uh, first, the Temple of Solomon, then what we sometimes call Herod's Temple. That was taken down stone by stone, exactly as Jesus predicted it would be. But the third temple has not been built. But that's actually something the Antichrist is going to do. So any movement toward the rebuilding of a third temple is of interest to the prophecy students. And something significant is going to happen when that third temple is rebuilt. 
by the Antichrist. Something called the abomination of desolation is going to take place. And in Matthew 24, Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, then it says, let the reader understand. That's fascinating because as I've said to you before, we need to understand Bible prophecy. It's not God's desire to conceal, but to reveal. So there's a little footnote. When you see the abomination of desolation, understand what this means. Jesus goes on to say, when you see the abomination of desolation, let those that are in Judea flee to the mountains and pray that your flight was not on Sabbath day, for then there will be great tribulation such as not happened since the beginning of time, nor ever shall be. So Antichrist emerges on the scene as a good guy. He appears as a good guy. Remember the four horsemen of the apocalypse? The first rider, the Antichrist, is on a white horse. He's an imitation Jesus. Remember, the prefix anti doesn't just mean against, it means instead of. Some will hail him as the very Messiah. He'll bring peace. He'll bring economic solutions. He'll rebuild the temple for the Jewish people. And everyone will be so happy. You know, they'll all be singing, like in the Lego movie. Everything is awesome, right? Not so. Then he'll show his true colors. At the halfway mark of the tribulation that lasts for seven years, Antichrist will show his true colors when he commits or does the abomination of desolation. You say, but what is that? It's when he erects an image of himself in the temple and demands that people worship it. 2 Thessalonians 2.4 says of Antichrist, he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or is worship. So he is God sitting in the temple of God whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and pretended miracles and lying wonders. So we look at this and we say, wow, that, that could happen soon, right? But before Antichrist can be revealed, the church must first be removed. So if Antichrist is getting close, then the coming of Jesus Christ for his people is even closer, right? So that's good news for us. Antichrist will deceive with his peaceful, I put in quotes, solutions. In fact, the Bible says through peace he will deceive many. And is that not the cry of so many today? No more wars. We want globalism. We don't want walls. We don't want barriers. We don't even want to identify as nations. We don't care if tyranny reigns. We don't care if we lose our freedom or liberty. We just want peace, man. All we're saying is just give peace a chance. Well, Antichrist will give you the peace, and that's how he will come in and get control. And uh, so in the midst of this darkness of the tribulation period, God raises up two powerful witnesses. Two radiant lights in this time of darkness. Who are these witnesses? Let's see if we can figure it out by rereading uh, verse 6. They have power to shut heaven, so no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. They have power over waters to turn them to blood and strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. I have to admit that would be a pretty cool superpower to strike someone with a plague when you wanted to. Someone cuts you off on the freeway, you're like, I'm plaguing you right now. May your car be filled with frogs. <laughs> I'm gonna throw in some locusts too. <laughs> Turn your bottle of water to blood. Whoa! <laughs> of course, they don't do that in a vindictive way, but who are these witnesses? Well, two, my, two people come to mind, Moses and Elijah. Moses, of course, uh, touched his staff to the Nile River and it turned to blood. Moses demanded the release of the Jewish people and the Pharaoh res uh, resisted. And a series of plagues came upon Egypt. So I believe one of these witnesses will be Moses brought back again. But Greg, when people die, they're dead. Yeah, but you know, God can do what he wants. Though it's true that it's appointed unto a man once to die, it appears that God is bringing Moses back for a final performance. And then we also have, I think, Elijah. He's a prophet that is identified as stopping the rain. Remember, he went into King Ahab and said, it will not rain, but according to my word, and calling fire down from heaven. Up on Mount Carmel, he faced off with the prophets of Baal and 
and he prayed and fire came from heaven. He also called fire on people that bothered him. There's a story of a time when uh, a new king replaced Ahab and he fell out of his bed and was injured horribly and sent his uh, representatives to go to the false temples and ask Baal for some wisdom and direction. And as these guys are on their way, they run into this interesting character. Uh, and he says, what, is there not a God in Israel that you have to go to seek counsel from Baal? So they go back to the king and said, we're, we're going to find out what was happening from Baal, but we ran into this guy. The king said, what did he look like? He was kind of hairy. It's Elijah. <laughs> so the king sends a captain with a group of 50 soldiers to arrest Elijah. It was on a little hilltop. And they walk up to him, hey, man of God, the king says, come down from there right now. Elijah says, if I'm a man of God, let fire come from heaven and consume you and your 50. Well, he was a man of God. <laughs> Torched. The king sends a second group of 50 soldiers with a captain. They go to the hill where Elijah is. Hey, man of God, the king says, come down from there at once. He wants to speak with you. Elijah says, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Again, they're torched. A third group of 50 is sent with a captain and he says, uh, sir, <laughs> I'm a family man. Here's pictures of my kids. Please, pretty please, come down. And the Lord says, go with them. And so Elijah comes down. But the point is, you didn't want to tick off Elijah. So these prophets, who I believe are probably Moses and Elijah, are bringing fire from heaven. Uh, they're stopping the rain. Plagues are coming and so forth. Uh, verse 6 speaks of the day of their prophecy. Prophecy in the New Testament does not necessarily refer exclusively to predicting the future. Its primary meaning means to speak forth, to proclaim, or to preach. So the gospel is going to go out in many ways during the tribulation period. We all we have the 144,000 witnesses that I describe as, you know, kosher Billy Grahams, right? Combing the planet. We have an angel flying through the heavens, ultimately proclaiming the everlasting gospel. And we have these two witnesses. And uh, look at verse 7 of chapter 11 of Revelation. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was also crucified. This beast that's being described is none other than Antichrist. He can't lay a finger on them until they have finished their testimony. And as I've said to you before, no one's going to lay a finger on you until you're done with what God has called you to do. So don't sit around worrying about when you're going to die. You'll die when that day comes that has been appointed. You will not live a day longer, but you will not live a day less either. So just finish your testimony. Finish your ministry. They finished what they were called to do. And they're killed. And they're laid in the street. And uh, everyone's watching. Look at verse 9. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and will not allow their dead bodies to be put in the grave. So Antichrist not only kills them, he was allowed to do that, but he wants to desecrate their bodies. Now, I, I have a bunch of commentaries and many on the book of Revelation. And I was reading one commentary written over 100 years ago. And the author was wondering how on earth could there come a moment in time when everyone in the world could see something at the same time? Well, we know the answer, don't we? I'm holding the answer in my hand. This is called a cell phone. <laughs> and of course, through satellite technology and live streaming, uh, this could be streamed effectively or broadcast to the entire world. And it even gets weirder because, uh, and by the way, most people have cell phones today. 96% of Americans have them. And uh, I read that there will be 17 billion mobile devices in use by 2024. So the, the tech is here. Okay, we don't even have to argue that point. 
But now these people take this tragic death of these two witnesses and turn it into some perverse celebration. Look at verse 10. Those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Excuse me? How do they torment people? They were telling them the truth. Coming back to the scroll of the book that John eats that turns bittersweet. <laughs> The word of God is sweet to the believer and it's bitter to the non-believer. So I'll read the Bible and it will comfort me and it will strengthen me and it will give me clarity and a non-believer will hear the Bible and say, I don't like that because it calls me out or tells me something I'm doing is wrong before God. And so people say, they're tormenting us, tormenting us these prophets. It reminds me of what the king uh, Ahab said to Elijah. When he came into his court in 1 Kings 18, 17, he said, Oh, troublemaker of Israel, why are you here? Elijah wasn't the troublemaker. King Ahab was the troublemaker. And often people will break the commandments of God, reap the consequences of doing it, and then blame God and blame Christians. Right? They're bringing it on themselves, and that's exactly what's happening here. And now they're having this weird celebration. Sort of like an upside down Christmas. You've heard of Christmas. Well, this is anti Christmas. You know, anti Christ, anti Christmas, giving gifts to one another. Maybe they'll take some of our songs. We wish you an anti Christmas. We wish you, I don't know. And they're giving gifts to each other. Hey, man, happy Dead Prophets Day. Isn't it great those guys are dead? Look, I got a feed on my phone. They're still dead. Isn't that great? This is wonderful. And they're partying and they're celebrating, having a great old time. And then God crashes their party. Verse 11, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God enters them. They stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here and they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. And at the same hour, there was an earthquake and a tenth of the city fell uh, in the earthquake and 7,000 people were killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Wow, wake up call. Reminds me of the story of King Belshazzar in the book of Daniel, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. His grandson, uh, father, uh, was a wicked man but turned to God. And so he died and his grandson didn't pay much attention to you know, grandpa's conversion. And so when he came into power, he had the bright idea of having a big party. He said, hey, let's get all those, you know, cups and things those Jews use in their worship of God and let's fill them with wine and let's give toast to the false gods of our nation, especially Dagon, who is half man and half fish. And so they're worshiping their false gods and the Bible says suddenly there was a hand writing on the plaster of the wall and the words were many, many, tekel, you farsin, which mean you've been weighed in the balances and you've been found lacking. And I love the King James description of what happened. It says that when the king saw this, his face turned pale with fright, his knees knocked together in fear and his legs gave way beneath him. It's actually implied in the original language he may have wet his pants. Which makes sense. If you saw a hand writing on a wall, just a hand right there, writing on the wall, you would probably be pretty shocked too. And so God stops this party and now war breaks out in heaven. You've heard of Star Wars, of course. And angels are described as stars. Now we see the original Star Wars. No Luke Skywalker, no Princess Leia, no Yoda, no Han Solo, but lots of angels duking it out in the supernatural world. Revelation chapter 12, verse seven. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and the angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. And that great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of the brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. 
Now pay very careful attention to this. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Underline that. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. And the word of their testimony. Underline that too. And finally, they did not love their lives to the death. I would also underline that. Verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the seal for and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great anger because he knows he has a short time. Now in these verses we learn a lot about our adversary, the devil. I would even say this is a chapter the devil doesn't want you to read. So aren't you glad you're reading it? Because you're going to get some insights into his methodology. Number one, the devil knows his days are numbered. He knows his days are numbered. His power working through a well-organized network of demons will come to an end one day. It's interesting that Michael and Satan are fighting. Not, not Satan and God. There's no contest there. Satan is nowhere close to being the equal of God. God is omniscient, knowing all things. Satan is limited in his knowledge. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. Satan is limited in his power. God is omnipresent, present everywhere. Satan can only be in one place at one time. So now he's fighting with Michael, but Michael is more powerful than Satan. Michael is the archangel, not a archangel. There's only one identified specifically in the Bible. Michael is the man. He's the head angel. He's the top guy and he, he defeats Satan. So basically Revelation 12 gives the order from Michael to take out the trash and Satan is dumped. So if you're following Satan, that's where you're going to. Don't follow a loser. The grammatical construction of the phrase in the Greek indicates Satan starts this. It can be translated Michael and the angels had to fight the dragon. Why would you pick a fight with someone who can beat you? Answer, sin makes you stupid. Satan's like, come on, let's go. Michael's like, seriously? Yeah, let's go. Michael's like, you talking to me? <laughs> and then he comes back and he defeats the dragon. What is this fight over? What ticks Satan off? I don't know. Maybe the brawl is triggered by the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel. So maybe Satan is angry specifically at Michael because he is the archangel. And so he throws a fit, but he loses this battle. So I raised the issue in the beginning, how to overcome the devil, but we've run out of time, so I don't have time to tell you. No, we'll close with that. How to overcome the devil. First of all, know this, point number two, the devil does not want you to know that he attacks with accusation. He attacks with accusation. Verse 10, the accuser of the brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. Look, the devil is no fool. Here's how he brings people down. He entices you. He lures you in. Go ahead, try it, take a bite. No one will ever know. It'll be fun. Play now pay later. Maybe never pay. Go for it. So you do it. You give in. And then the moment you give in to that sin, he comes back as the accuser. You miserable hypocrite. Do you think God will hear your prayers? Don't even think of approaching God. See, before we sin, when he's tempting us, he'll tell, he'll tell us we can get away with it. But after we sin, he shouts, you'll never get away with it. Now, here's what we need to understand. The difference between Satan's accusations and condemnation and the Holy Spirit's conviction. The Holy Spirit will convict or convince you of your sin because he loves you. John 16, 8 says, Jesus speaking, when he comes, speaking of the Spirit, he will convince the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. So if you do something wrong and you feel a sense of guilt... And shame and realize you've sinned, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And what you should do now is turn to the Lord, repent of your sin, and ask him to forgive you. And he will. But if you are driven to despair and hopelessness, if you feel like walking away from God and never opening your Bible again, or never showing up in church again, you're listening 
to the wrong voice. Listen, God's Holy Spirit will convict you through the word of God to bring you back into fellowship with your father. Satan will accuse you and use your sins in a hateful way to drive you from the father. So how do we overcome the devil? The answer is in verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. <clears throat> How do we overcome the devil? They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. So we may feel as though we can approach God. We'll say, well, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to pray. I'm not worthy to read the Bible. I'm not worthy to share the gospel. I'm not worthy to go to church. Newsflash, you are never even on your best day even close to being worthy. So let's just drop the worthy. You're not worthy, never will be worthy. Uh, it just isn't gonna be that way. You have to know you're a sinner and the only way you can ever approach God is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's not based on what you do for God, it's based on what God has done for you. Right, that's it. <clears throat> it's always gonna be that way. We think, well, I'm, I failed, uh, God's mad at me. Correction, God is not mad at you. God is mad about you. God loves you. God welcomes you. God longs to hear from you. After Adam's sin, what do we see happening in the Garden of Eden? We hear the Father calling out, Adam, where are you? Did God say that because he didn't know where Adam was? No, he knew where Adam was. He called out to him because he longed for Adam. He wanted to talk to Adam. He loved Adam and he loves you. And the story of the prodigal son that Jesus told, showing us what God is like, we have the father running to his wayward son who has gone astray and welcoming him. That's how God feels toward you. So we overcome him by the blood of the lamb. Hebrews 10, 19 says, Dear friends, we can boldly enter into heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. This is the new life-giving way that Christ has opened up for us through the sacred curtain by means of his death for us. It's through the blood of the Lamb I can approach him. Ephesians 2, 13 says, You who were sometimes afar off have been made near by your good works. Does it say that? No. It says, you who are sometimes afar off have been made near by the blood of Christ. First John tells us that we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So you've got to apply the blood. And you're saying, well, what does that even mean? Okay, remember when Israel uh, was still in bondage to Egypt and God told Moses, uh, and Pharaoh that a time of judgment was coming on Egypt. And he told his people, take the lamb, slay the lamb, take the blood of the lamb, put it on the top of your doorway, on the right and on the left. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over, right? So when the judgment of God came, it passed over every home where the blood was applied. So you've got to apply the blood. You mean like literally put blood on my door? Uh, no. Nope. What I mean is apply the blood. Oh, I'm feeling guilty. I can't approach God. Apply the blood. Lord, I have access to you right now and I'm not gonna let the father of lies keep me from you. I approach you now through the blood of the lamb. You've done, you've done something you're ashamed of, something you wish you had never done. Uh, apply the blood of the lamb. Lord, I know this was wrong. I'm sorry I did it but I, I know you've forgiven me and I accept your forgiveness. There, you just applied the blood of the lamb. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Number two, point number four, they overcame him by the word of their testimony. The word of their testimony. You know, when a believer is walking in fellowship with God, they will want to tell others. And the way you gain ground in the Christian life is through evangelism. See, the best defense is a good offense. You know, so when you go into a work site and you're the new guy or new girl and somehow you let people know you're a Christian, not in a weird religious way, I'm a Christian. No, no. <laughs> it just comes out. You know, they see the Bible on your desk. I remember talking with uh, former Secretary of State Michael Pompeo 
and uh, he talked to us about how he had a Bible on his desk. He says, I'm a Christian. I read the Bible every day. I want it on my desk. Someone said, Mr. Secretary, you shouldn't have a Bible on your desk. He says, leave that Bible on my desk. It's important to me. See, that, that's making a statement. Uh, this is what I believe. Or maybe you pray and ask God's blessing before you have a meal. Or, or there's something else. You kind of mark it. Like, yes, I'm a Christian. Now you know you're being watched. But in a way, it's almost making yourself accountable. Because non-believers have certain expectations of believers, don't they? And there's nothing worse than being called out by a non-believer. Especially when they're right. When you do something you shouldn't have done, you said something you shouldn't have said, they say, I thought you were a Christian. Ugh, yes. Okay, so they overcome him by the word of their testimony. In other words, they come out and say, we're Christians, we're followers of Jesus, we're not ashamed. As I've told you before, every believer has a testimony. It may be a good one, it may be a poor one, but you have one. A testimony is primarily talking about what God has done for you. They overcame him by the word of their testimony. I mean, we give recommendations for everything. Like maybe you're in a town you've never been to before and you're thinking about eating in a restaurant and you're thinking, is this place any good? Let's go see what Yelp says. What is Yelp? It's a bunch of random people opining. And who are the people that go on Yelp and write these long things, you know? I mean, do I really need to trust them? And so they give their glowing recommendation. But here's my point. If you like something, you'll talk about it. So you'll go on Yelp and you'll recommend your favorite hamburger place or your favorite place for this or your favorite place for that. So you're telling me you'll talk about burgers, but you won't talk about Jesus. Make your recommendation. They overcame him by the word of their testimony. That's forward momentum. The blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony. And finally... They did not love their lives to the death. What does that mean? It means they knew their lives belonged to God. Do you know that your life belongs to God? He bought you out of a slave market. The Bible says you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God with your body. I'm glad I belong to God. But not only am I his purchased possession, I'm also his friend. Jesus said, from this moment on, I no longer call you servants, but friends. Servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but everything I've heard from my father, I've revealed to you. Well, that's amazing. But then he calls me his son and his daughter. For as many as received him, he gave them the power to become sons of God. And then he also calls me his bride. I'm the bride of Christ. Some guys are saying, I don't want to be a bride. You're a bride. Deal with it. I'm good with it. I'm his bride. I'm his friend, I'm his child, I'm his purchased possession. That means he's going to protect me and he's in control of my life. And these folks knew their lives belonged to God. No one could take their life if God didn't allow it. And so they trusted the Lord to the very end. So let me ask you this in closing. Are you overcoming or are you overcome? I've talked about overcoming the devil. He's real. Only a person who's put their faith in Christ has any defense against him. When you have Jesus living inside of you, it's a game changer. But if you're not a Christian yet, you're kind of open prey for our enemy who can attack you at will. Maybe there's some sin that's got a foothold in your life and you can't break free and you've tried and you've tried. You need to ask God to forgive you. Jesus shed his blood for you on the cross 2,000 years ago so you don't have to be under the power of sin any longer. And if you've never believed in Jesus, if you've not asked him to come into your life, you can do it right here, right now. Because Jesus died on that cross and he rose again from the dead three days later. Now he stands at the door of your life and he knocks and he says, if you'll hear his voice and open the door, he'll come in. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, you can do it right here, right now. Everything can change for you. You can have the guaranteed hope that when you die, you will go to heaven. And not only that, but you can find the meaning and purpose of life you've been searching for. And you can do it right now. Let's all bow our heads for a prayer. Father, I pray for all those that have joined us. 
today, those that are watching, I pray that you'll speak to every heart. And for those that don't know you yet, I pray that your Holy Spirit will convict and convince them of their need for Jesus. Help them to come to you. Help them to believe in you. Help them to receive your forgiveness right here, right now. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying, if you would like Jesus Christ to come into your life, if you would like him to forgive you of your sin, if you would like to go to heaven when you die, you can just pray this prayer with me wherever you are. Just pray these words. You can pray them out loud if you like. Pray these words, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for me. I turn from my sin and I choose to follow you from this moment forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. God bless you that prayed that prayer.